And we're going to turn for our consideration this evening to that passage we read, which was in Luke 9. And uh, there's one verse in particular that I want to focus on, but we'll um, give you some background first of all. Uh, the verse is a, a very well-known one, actually, and it's this one, verse 62 of Luke chapter 9, where the Lord Jesus said to a man inquiring, No man, having put his hand to the plough and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. And uh, to me, anyway, it's often a wonder that there are such familiar verses. We know them so well. And uh, I think in many cases, often the wonderful truths that they contain are hidden in plain sight. We know that verse so well that we've overlooked perhaps some of its wider application. Uh, so that's what I'd like to do today is pause particularly with this one verse and see what it teaches us. There's so much that we can learn from it. The context, I am sure, is the gospel, is the preaching and the proclamation of the gospel. And uh, so we need to ask ourselves uh, what it represents to us. The Lord Jesus Christ is responding to, as he walks along, he encounters various people, some inquired, some he spoke to, and it seems that, for the most part, they had a deficient or inadequate view of what it was to be a disciple. They had their own ideas. They may have been well-intended, they may have been sincere people, but the Lord, of course, uh, was required to put them right, to be direct with them, to explain to them what it meant. If he would follow me, for example, uh, I have no home, foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't have anywhere to lay his head. That wasn't literally true, actually. Of course, he did reside in various places, but he wasn't a resident. He didn't own property. He wasn't here for that purpose. And so, instantly, that's one message. If you will be a follower of him, you need to have a light hold upon uh, the things of this earth. But I won't expound all of those verses, except to say that these are in the context of following him, of coming to Christ, of what it means to commit your life to him. My heading here from verse 57 is the teaching about discipleship, and I'm sure that that is a very good heading and uh, things that we can derive from it. So what does the plow represent? There's a lot here, and I hope you don't think that I'm going to be drawing too much out of this simple uh, metaphor. What does the plow represent? Well, at its simplest, uh, it represents the Christian life. Uh, there's no question about that. You're entering into faith, you will follow Christ, and you will live a Christian life. Uh, that's, uh, I think, beyond debate. But more than that, I believe that it, first and foremost, or at least the emphasis of that metaphor, is that it's a gospel plow. That it is, uh, you are, you and I, in the Christian life, as well as all of the other duties and uh, Christian experience that is to be ours, the growing in faith, and many, many other things besides. This theme of preaching and proclaiming the gospel must be there. And this isn't just enthusiastic evangelists who are making the case. The Lord Jesus himself was the primary evangelist. He preached the gospel. And uh, I, I believe the context tells us that this picture of the plough is uh, uh, referring a lot, as well as the Christian life in general, but it's uh, speaking about the gospel also. For example, uh, the man who said, uh, or rather in fifth, verse 59 uh, here in our chapter, he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. That was kind of an excuse, if you will. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury the dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. So from the very outset, it seems that this was the first encounter that this man had with Christ, is that the Lord said to him, above all else, if you will follow me, be a preacher, not a formal preacher necessarily, be an evangelist, have a testimony. It's almost the first thing that he said. You can find many other instances of this also. You can think of the, the demon-possessed man uh, who, when he sat at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, said that he would want to go with Jesus. 
But the Lord said, no, stay and tell the people what wonderful things God has done. The first instruction to the new convert was, be a witness. And uh, I'd just like to support this from a few other analogies and metaphors that are here in the scripture. Uh, you, you know, I'm sure, that the Lord Jesus spoke often using an agricultural uh, picture or a harvesting picture or one of a vineyard, all about cultivation and about the fruit. And uh, so our picture is the same. This is a, a farming, a tilling picture. This is to do with working the land. And so, you know, of course, the sower and the seed, uh, there is the picture of the scattering of the seed, and we're told that the seed represents the Word of God. Uh, this is uh, in Luke's Gospel, just a chapter or two before us, in chapter 8. And it's one of those um, uh, um, uh, parables that the Lord explains the meaning of the parable. Very helpful, actually, for interpretation. He doesn't do that for all of the parables, but in some of them, he actually tells us what, they, what, what it means. So he tells us, as you know, what the different soil types mean, what the path means, the hardness of the heart, how the devil will pick away the seed, and so on. But I'm just trying to make the point that the agricultural picture is absolutely one of the gospel. It's about conversion. So that uh, in the end, only the good soil yielded fruit. Only the good soil, which means not intrinsically good, because none of us is good, but that prepared soil, that heart that had been turned over, that all the evil had been exposed, so that the soil and heart was now ready and prepared to receive the truth. And the evidence of Christian life is fruit, whether it be 30 or 60 or 100 fold. That's a different issue. That's in the Lord's hand, hands. But the evidence of spiritual life is fruit by their by their fruit, by their works, you shall know them. That's one, and I'll just refer to another before we get into our verse. Uh, and the other one is in Matthew 13, verse 37, and this is the parable of the wheat and the tares, and I'm sure you're all familiar with it, at least an outline, how a man sowed his field with wheat, and an enemy came and sowed tares because he wanted to spoil his crop. And so the farmer said, what shall we do? What can we do? Shall we, the laborers rather to the farmer, shall we pull out the tares because they will spoil the crop or they will confuse us at harvest time? And they said, no, leave them there. And the two shall be separated, the one from the other, the wheat from the tares. And in that parable also, we have explanations for the elements. I'll just tell you what they are quickly before we come back to uh, our, our verse. So it tells us there that the sower of the seed is the Son of Man, and by extension preaches you and me, because uh, the value and uh, teaching of that parable cannot end with Christ's ascension. He is not the only preacher, and his disciples and you and me follow, forth, follow afterwards. So in that parable, another agricultural one of sowing, Son of Man. The field, it tells us, is the world. So this is very simple. This is kind of ABC of what the gospel is and what these pictures mean. So we sow the seed in the world. But you see the plough. I'm going to come back to the plough. But I'm just trying to establish that I, we're in the right area by applying it to the gospel. So the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. So fruit, harvest, converted people. But let's look then at our verse. That's really just by way of introduction, but I don't want you to charge me saying, well, I don't think I don't see that in, in the passage. You're, you're taking too much from that. But I hope that I've established that this is the area that the Lord has in mind, and the context is of the gospel. So Jesus said unto him, verse 62, No man, having put his hand to the plough and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. So I'm just going to make a number of observations and points. The metaphor of ploughing is somewhat onerous. It does require some endeavour and some effort and some application. That field is not going to plough itself. And this isn't just uh, casually pulling out a few wheel, uh, weeds. It's uh, quite a laborious process. Certainly in those days, before any mechanisation, 
where uh, you'd have to have your plow pulled by animals uh, and you'd have to guide that plow and you'd have to keep the furrow straight. Well, it's demanding, so it requires application and diligence and perseverance. And until you've got that field plowed, well, it may be done in a day, it's true, but let's assume it takes longer than that and you've got more than one field, you've got to get up each morning. You've got to have a plan. You've got to go to it. You've got to harness that plow to your oxen or to your asses, or in this country it would have been horses, or whatever beast would pull your plow. And uh, it, it, it takes some thought and some endeavor and some effort, and uh, you've got to do it. So gospel work takes some degree of discipline, some degree of resolve. We've got to decide and understand that this is not only part of our role and our calling, but that we've got to kind of go to it. Um, and I don't want to make this sound too difficult and uh, hard and think, well, I'm not up to that, because we can all be involved. And uh, it's uh, a lot easier than perhaps the metaphor suggests. But nevertheless, these elements must be there. You must uh, have intention. As a believer, are you going to ask the Lord to give you opportunities to be involved in the work of the gospel? And that could be anything, really. Any role in the church, praying for the gospel. Um, you can literally be directly involved, knocking on doors, handing out leaflets, witnessing. But whatever you do to support a gospel preaching church, that will be seen as part of that work, uh, to have spiritual objectives in view. So that's a point I'll make straight away. And uh, if we're sitting here thinking, well, that's all very well, but I'm sure this doesn't apply to everybody who becomes a Christian. This is surely just some people. Uh, some people are very good at witnessing. Some people are very good at explaining the gospel, and that's not me. And I find it difficult. Well, that's absolutely fine. The Lord is very gentle. He's not going to force you to do something that's impossible, but he would want us all to go out of our comfort zone. He would expect us all to make some effort. So where do I get this from? That you all and me are included in this instruction. Simply because the Lord says, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of heaven. And so the metaphor says that being a Christian and putting your hand to what I'm trying to say mainly is that gospel plow includes everybody. Else you are not fit or fitted for the kingdom of God. That doesn't mean you're not qualified because none of us is qualified. It's by grace alone. But it means our heart isn't right. Surely that's the undeniable sense of the verse. So everybody should be in some way involved. And uh, if not, if you go back to the picture of those days, if a farmer decided one day, you know what, this year I'm not going to bother plowing my field. I've done that every single year and it's just too much like hard work. I'm just not going to bother this year. I'm going to take the summer off. Well, come winter time, he hasn't got a crop. He's got no harvest, there's no return, there's no reward. He's wasted his time and his energy and his life. And it's the same with the believer too. What will there be to show for our lives? What fruit will there be at the end of our lives? And it says here also, no man having put his hand to the plow. You see, that's a voluntary action after all. There was, uh, that man has got to do it. He's decided that this is uh, his, he knows that this is his lot in life. It's his lot to till the ground, to work on the soil, to sow a crop, to bring in a harvest. And that's our lot also. And we have, and so what I'm saying is he chooses that, and, or he accepts it, and he gets on with it. And... Uh, we need to realize that when we became Christians, we put our hand to the plow. We did it voluntarily, notwithstanding the fact that all of the work of salvation is wrought by the Spirit of God, but he makes us willing so that we choose him in the end, so that our eyes are open, the scales fall off, 
We see our wretched condition. We fly to him for salvation. So he doesn't override our will, but he makes us willing so that we chose this life. And one of the reasons that I make this point, and, and one of the reasons I even selected the whole passage, is because of the days in which we live. And I suppose this could apply, apply in all ages, but I think especially in the last year or year and a half that we've been through, is that uh, we're here for the duration. And that we shouldn't be put off by setbacks and difficulties and hard work. And uh, we need to keep going. And we need to press on. We put our hand to the plow. And we're not to look back. Isn't that the command of the Lord? There were no caveats here. There were no conditions. The Lord didn't say, well, that's okay, up to a point. But I don't expect you to carry on in adverse conditions. You can give it up if you find it too arduous. Have a go. See how you get on. That's not really the language of the Bible, is it? Now, I don't want to make this sound as if it is uh, hard because the Lord is ever so gentle. But you can see that there is a kind of steel in the argument. There is a kind of certainty and fixed nature to this. So we've opted to this. Also, hands on. No man having put his hand to the plough. I think that's very helpful to us. Because uh, we're directly involved if we can be. How many people say, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. And I think about the Lord quite often. No, I don't go to church or anything. I do read the Bible every now and then. And many people, and I, I'm not deriding these people because I know people like that close to me. And they sincerely believe that they're okay with the Lord. They genuinely think they're fine. But they appear not to have had any Christian experience. Certainly they're not hands-on. They're not, they're not, they don't have their hand on any gospel plow. But uh, isn't that here? Having put your hand, I think uh, uh, the Lord spoke under inspiration, of course. These were his very words. So that hands-on is helpful to us. Do what you can. Not literally. Well, maybe there are times literally where your hands are involved in making something, fixing something, helping somebody. But it's a figure, isn't it? Hands-on. Get, get involved as far as you can. One accepts that we all have different roles. Not all have the opportunity to do the same thing. Not all are young and fit or have time for perhaps youth work or other things. But wherever the Lord has given you that field of opportunity, and I'll speak about that, then hands on if you can be. There must be a plan, mustn't there? This is another thing. It's not to be done randomly. Um, and it's repetitive. It's not very, a very glamorous occupation, ploughing, is it? I know that you find enthusiasts everywhere, and certainly in some parts of the world there are ploughing competitions and all that sort of thing, but that's kind of not in the view of most of us. And in this picture, it's just a, a repetitive job. And it's the same with gospel ploughing. You're going out into that community and say, well, I've knocked these doors already, and I've been out before. And I've witnessed before, and I've handed out tracts before, and nothing much is happening. But you're plowing. You keep going up and down. Plow another furrow. Plow another furrow. Prepare the ground, is the picture and the analogy. Have a plan, and uh, be involved. Take your part in this also. There will be people that you can witness to and pray for. Your community, colleagues, family. Well, we need the Holy Spirit, of course, to break up the ground. We can't do that. It's not by force of argument. It's not by reasoning. It's not by eloquence. Well, we've seen that because, as I mentioned this morning, the words of Christ himself people turned away from. They uh, refused when they heard the deep teaching. When the Lord Jesus said to Peter and the others, Will you leave me also? And Peter said, To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life. But many, 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 and this was following the feeding of the 5,000 who had heard him preaching by all accounts, if you read it, probably all afternoon, the very words of the Saviour, and most turned away. So it's not the eloquence. Christ himself was not received by many. So we need the Spirit in this very much. There must be a certain methodology, if I'm not pressing this metaphor 
too far. I hope you won't charge me with that. But you've got to be a little bit careful if you do have the opportunity to witness. Now, if you're ploughing, now I hope that we don't have any people who are uh, farmers here because they'll probably tell me I've got this completely wrong. But I think uh, it would be right to say that if you're ploughing, you've got to direct the blade uh, into the ground at a certain angle. And it's got to turn over the soil, it's got to break up the clods. And if it were to just skim along the surface, and the, plant, and the farmer thought, well, this is pretty easy, this thing's just bouncing along, I'm making a few marks in the soil, uh, the, the oxen are pretty happy because they aren't sweating too much, and you've just scratched the surface. It's going to be no good. When you throw the seed on, there's, there's no, no soil to turn over, it'll be gone. So my point is, when you witness, don't be too shallow, don't be too light. And this is a point that many churches are guilty of. Oh, come to Jesus. No, you don't have to change your life. We don't talk too much about sin. Come to Jesus and you'll have a happy time. And uh, well, we offer you all other manner of enticements besides that shallow preaching. And that'll bring you wood, hay and stubble. That won't bring you a crop. So we've got to strike the balance. The other extreme, of course, and I'm sure many of us have been guilty of this, is that you set your plough too deep and it digs down into the ground. And it's hard work. And as you try to guide it, you can't steer it because there's so much soil that's resisting the work and the oxen are labouring and panting and puffing. Not much, much progress is being made. And you might think, well, if I dig deep, then I'll have turned over ever so much soil and I can have a tremendous crop. But you won't make much progress. You'll hardly get up and down the field and everyone will be exhausted. My point is here is that if you witness to someone, don't try and go too deep. Don't try and tell them the whole gospel, the whole system of theology from beginning to end. I'm sure we've all done this. We've got the uh, sympathetic ear and we think, well, this is it. I'm, they're going to get the whole lot now. And uh, they might be a very patient listener, but they've turned off because you're really just overdoing it. And perhaps you're touching on many things that are not helpful. So pray, we all need this wisdom. What's the balance? What are those few words I could say to my friend or my colleague? Just enough. Perhaps many of us are guilty of not saying anything, and so we're even worse than shallow witnesses. But be careful, and one hears this report often of people who have really been quite offended by the witness of Christians. And I'm sure that those Christians will think that's simply because the gospel offended them. But it could be that they offended them. We can be offensive. So pray that we might not be the ones that will offend. The gospel will offend, yes. It'll touch sensitive areas. It'll put a finger on sin, and that's uncomfortable. But pray for wisdom that we have just that right balance, that the soil is prepared. Of course, we don't bring the uh, fruit that is from the Lord. Here's another point. Create, uh, labor itself, work is a creation mandate. In other words, from the beginning, from even before the fall, uh, Adam and Eve, the human race, was expected to be to work, to labor in the field. They were uh, had an orchard or a farm of some sort that would be produced to care for. It wasn't going to grow itself. One might picture paradise as just reclining and eating fruit and enjoying the sun and you know the life. No, there was work to do even before the fall. And that continues, of course, now with the sweat of our brow, now with thorns and thistles. But I believe that it extends also to the Christian life. There is work to do. Some people might think, no, no, no. To be a Christian is just to rest. You know, the world is so complicated and I've got so much going on and I love Christian truth and I love fellowship and I just like to sit and drink it all in. And Ah, oh, that's wonderful. Well, it is wonderful, but it's, there's more to it than that. There's work to do. Who's going to do that work? The Lord has given us that job to do. Not just special people, but all of us. And uh, think of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't he our ultimate example? He said in Luke 2.49, I must be about my Father's business. Are we about our Father's business? Do we have something of that urgency. I'm not suggesting that we're zealots and we're kind of buzzing with uh, 
uh, undue enthusiasm and sort of a bit hyperactive. It would be a bit scary, wouldn't it? But at least have that sense of duty. I must be about my father's business. It is going to be measured. It's not all at once. There's got to be a plan and a program. That farmer will have a plan for his lands. He may leave some fallow for some years. He might plough others. He might rotate the crops. Uh, he might discuss with neighbours better farming methods. He will look to the weather. So there's a lot to it. And it's not always the same thing. Here's another point uh, which I'll make. And this is a very encouraging point and a very obvious one. We don't have to pull that plough. For all the effort, and we've got to direct it so that we're, we've got straight furrows and that we're ploughing deep enough and preparing the ground for the crop. But we're not alone. In fact, we couldn't do that work. And the plough is not designed for us to pull it. You can't push it. That's impossible. You'll never get anywhere. So you rely upon the force and the power of those yoked animals. And they do all the hard work, actually. They're the unsung heroes, if you will. They quietly, one assumes, get on, get on with the work. They're powerful, those oxen, and I'm sure other animals, asses, horses, and they pull that plow so that it breaks up the soil. And the Lord is our strength, and he goes before us. And the gospel, if you will, is yoked to the Holy Spirit. And he would help us and bless us if we're prepared to do the work. You note that those oxen, they're not going to plough. They're not going to do the work themselves. It's a cooperative effort. It's a union. There's a, a yoking together. And so it is with the Spirit. We have that amazing spirit, uh, privilege that we work with the Holy Spirit, with God. We're co-workers. He could do it all. He could convert men in an instant, and women. But he chooses to involve sinful and inadequate people like you and me to be his servants. He gives us that privilege. So that's a wonderful thing. Well, it's hard work, as I mentioned. You have to work through the heat of the day at times. And uh, it might be hard and you might not feel up to it. And the sun might be beating down. But you know that the season is passing. You know that if you don't plough now, perhaps the sun will make that soil so hard that you can't break it up at all. Or perhaps the rains will come where you'll become clogged and bogged down in the mud. So you must do it now, today. Get on with it. And we should have something of that uh, attitude and mindset. And there's bound to be problems, and difficulties. Your oxen one day might be misbehaving and rebellious, not want to be out. You have to chase them and cajole them. You might find that you hit a rock and your plough gets broken. Ploughs, of course, in olden days were mainly wood. And so they would have made them very robustly and of hard woods. But they weren't very strong. And then, of course, steel and iron and so on came in. But they, too, can be broken by hitting rocks and being bent and blunted. Well, what do you do? Do you go back to your wife and children and say, ah, plough's broken. What are you going to do now? Oh, nothing. No, you've got to make a plan. You've got to fix it. You might seek help from your neighbour, uh, work together, and that's true of gospel work. We can support one another. Things will go wrong. There will be setbacks. There will be disappointments. But as I said in the beginning, and one of the reasons I wanted to speak about this is you keep going anyway. You work around it. There may be a delay in time. But it's not the end of the story. Uh, if you speak to any farmer, they'll probably tell you their entire life is all about um, resolving problems, and difficulties, and mechanical failures. Well, they've just got to make a plan and keep going. And so must we also uh, to do those things. But you know, this picture also uh, occurred to me, that um, the work itself, the work itself, Christian service, is an antidote to so much spiritual malaise. It really is. You know, one of the geniuses of Sunday schools and, and young people's works is not just that it brings the gospel to communities 
and we look for the salvation of souls. But those employed in it are themselves blessed and trained. And when you have that hands-on approach and you see the children coming in and being attentive, and over many years perhaps before anyone has converted, then your own heart is warmed and your prayers are stimulated. And so this picture of being busy in the gospel work is a tremendous antidote to spiritual danger also. If he weren't plowing the field, if that farmer wasn't plowing the field, he might. we're restless people, aren't we? We can't just be sitting there doing nothing. Maybe some of us can, better than others. But for many of us, we can't do that. And so we'll find something else to do. And before long, we found something else to do. You often hear of this about people who don't really have a plan. And they tell you vaguely, they've got a few ideas. And when you speak to them a few months or years later, there are all sorts of strange ideas that they've tried and nothing's really come of it. So, so helpful to have a focus and a plan. And uh, if that's Christian service, that'll be so helpful to you. So an antidote to backsliding too. Because if you're busy in the Lord's work and if you've expended your time and energy on the Lord's day and when you have opportunity, and you haven't really got much other time and energy for other things that could lead you astray. And how much better to be involved in the Lord's work. So there's that also. Time to think. I'm not sure that the two really go together, I suppose, if you're very busy in Christian service, but I think it is the case that uh, there's time for the farmer anyway. He's alone. He's, it's a solitary work. He might see his neighbor plowing, his brother or his uncle or father might take over, but essentially it's a, it's a kind of one-man job. And even today, uh, I've seen it when we've been out in Suffolk on our boys' camp and they've got to get the harvest in before the rains come when it's been dry for a while. And they'll be out there at night time, 8, 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night, with their lights shining across the field. But for all the sophisticated machinery, it's just one man by himself going up and down. And gospel work can be like that too. You can feel alone. You might be the only one in your place of work, in your family. Wherever you're set, I'm the only one. I feel alone, isolated. But the Lord is with you. And you're doing a tremendous work. But you can reflect also, I was going to say, on the creation. That farmer will look around and he will know <coughs> the seasons. He will know when there's a change in the temperature and the atmosphere and the humidity. He will know when the rains are coming. He will know when there's a beautiful sunset, sunrise. A season for this animal, that animal, this bird or that. And he will appreciate them and he will have a refined sense. Whereas us townies will walk out there and don't know what we're looking at stumble through and trample on all sorts of things and fear the great outdoors. But really, as Christian people, we should be reflecting also on the wonderful creation of our God. Well, just a few more of these. Obstacles and enemies. Well, we've, we've heard of some already uh, in the parable of the sower. You've got the thorns, you've got the rocks, you've got the shallow soil, you've got the birds. Birds are such a menace. In some countries, they really are devastating. Locusts, terrible. Um, baboons in Africa, they come and steal the crop. They wait till it's nice and ripe, or if not, even before then, they come and rip it to pieces. And you've, you know, you've patiently nurtured that crop. And then in a moment, hoarded monkeys or baboons or wild pigs, well, any number of pests and diseases. Not easy, is it, farming? Even as an urban gardener, you soon discover that uh, there's all sorts of enemies out there, slugs and frost and birds and goodness knows what else. And it's the same with us in gospel work. There's going to be many enemies, much infiltration, much undermining, much attack, much wrong teaching. And we have to be aware of those things and ask for wisdom. It's a long-term project, remember that, and gospel work is long-term. It's not going to happen overnight. In fact, you and I might not see much fruit of our labours all the days of our lives. You might say, I taught Sunday school for years. And we did have some encouragements, but what happened to the hundreds that passed through? And we never saw them again. We don't know what became of them. And was all that labour for vain? Well, it won't be. 
But so often also, and I'm sure that there's some even here who are the fruit of gospel preaching when they were young. And it didn't happen straight away. Often that seed was sown into the mind of a young person and they fought against it, sought to stifle it, to bury it, and not in the good agricultural sense of burying it, just to bury it out of sight, to stifle it, to deny it any oxygen of truth, to live for this world, to be determined and resolved to, ex to expel all that gospel and church from their lives. But they couldn't because that seed was in their lives and it began to grow up and break through the hardness of their heart and eventually the light of day and they became believers. So it's a long-term work. Don't look for fruit straight away. But believe that as you sow that fruit, as you witness, it will be blessed. There's no doubt about that. We're working for the kingdom. Here's a great motivation. I know I don't want to tax you too much on a warm evening. But here's a great motivation. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. No less. We're not preaching for social reform. We're not preaching in the hope that a few lives will be straightened out a little bit and those people will be slightly happier. We're preaching for the kingdom of God. This is real. It's not a fairy tale. This is the real kingdom of God. And that's what the Lord Jesus called us into. And that's what we're involved with. This everlasting, unchanging, eternal kingdom. Glorious kingdom. And souls saved will be there eternally. From meager beginnings, you might say. From unpromising starts. From unlikely gospel candidates. How many of us were likely gospel candidates? There's no particular likely person. The Lord brings fruit out of all people. And so there it is also. We see the fruit after many days. We take the long-term view. Now just a, a word of comfort here, because you might think, well, brother, you've laid on us quite an arduous uh, obligation and duty here, and uh, I'm quite overwhelmed by it. One has to say, if I'm fair to the metaphor, that there are seasons also, and that it is true that you don't plough every day. There are seasons. So there will be times that are not the same, not as intensive, if you will. And so we must make that observation that there are different times and seasons also. Another point I wanted to quickly make is uh, it was actually in the uh, parable of the tares. It talked about the man's field, his field. Now that field was his, uh, it was his responsibility and uh, he had to deal with it. Now I believe that the Lord does give to each of us a field of opportunity. Well I suppose I've mentioned it really in terms of those prospective people you might speak to, your colleagues and so on, but that's your field. I have a field, you have a field, it might be big, it might be small. Some fields you find if you go to a farm and they say, well, where's your field? You say, well, I've got one here. I've got one right over there. And you're walking around. They're not all together. It's not always organized. And maybe that's the same with you. You have different fields of opportunities. Well, even if you think, well, brother, you really have made too many points that I don't think are there. Well, I hope they are. But you can't deny this one. And this is the primary point. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. So... This will be my final point as we conclude. Looking back is fatal, is damaging to the Christian. Looking back. You see, the implication is that you've committed yourself to this Christian life. You're going to see it through, not you, but with God's help. I don't know how you felt, but one of the things that held me back when I was seeking the Lord is I looked at Christians and I thought, there's no way I could keep that up. I wouldn't last a day, a week, a month. No ways. How do I keep up this Christian life? I, I can't live like that. But you know what? Years later, we find that we have by God's grace. And he helps us to look forward. And the motivations and the incentives are there, aren't they? We've laid out some of them. And we'll lay out one or two more as we finish. But don't be distracted 
Oh, and sadly, don't we know many people like this? Warm Christians, converted, maybe for years. They've been involved and they've been busy. And then gradually you find that they're kind of looking back or looking sideways and they're looking to what the world has and they've, they feel that they've done their part, they've played their part, they've contributed to the family farm and it's for others now to take over. Aren't they looking back rather? And perhaps some people do literally look back to their old lives. Oh, I miss those things. Young people go back to perhaps the music that they had given up that they'd put behind them, those things they might have watched, conversations they might have, the things they'd listened to that they used to, are they going back to them? Well, you're not fitted then. Uh, your heart is wrong for this, so don't look back. Well, just a couple of verses then to conclude everything. And uh, they're predictable verses. So everything I'm saying today is plain, straightforward and predictable, but sometimes those Familiar verses are what we need to go over. So 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Uh, and many sermons have been preached just on this verse. Always, always abounding in the work of the Lord. This is the appeal that Paul makes to the Corinthians. Always abounding. That's, that's a lot. Abounding is a lot, isn't it? It's not just always slightly involved. Always making a minor contribution. But I mustn't stop on every word. But this word, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's for every Christian, work, labor. For as much as you know, this is the incentive, you know for sure that your work is, is going to be blessed, that your labor, here's another hard word, working word, is not in vain in the Lord. So many words there, everyone precious. What you do in the Lord might be and is, not only unnoticed, but actually despised by the world. They don't care. They don't rate our message. They don't think it is of any relevance whatsoever. They're not moved by it, touched by it, impressed by it. But in the Lord, it's mighty. In the Lord, he is pleased. This is his work. This is what he did. And so we should follow also. And uh, as we begin to emerge, hopefully, from this pandemic, and as we have encountered some setbacks and disappointments, as I said, always take the long-term view. It's not over yet, and there's still the harvest, and there's souls that will be saved, and Christ will be glorified, and there is the marriage supper of the Lamb. And uh, having worked, it's not in vain. We don't, we don't just plough for the fun of it. I don't think many people do that. You never know. But certainly, no. People plough for a purpose when they get up on those cold and misty mornings by themselves and they're digging over the earth. It's because they know in the future there will be a crop. In the future there will be a harvest. Sometime down the line they will be sitting with their family and friends. Their barns will be filled. They'll be secure. And that's why they do it. That's why we do it also. And uh, so I'll just finish with a couple of familiar verses also. I'm sure you know these. Psalm 126 and the last two verses, verses 5 and 6. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. What motivation that is for us. And what a picture the Lord has set before us. We don't need to be theologians to understand it. It's very plain and simple. But may it be a help and challenge to all of us. May the Lord bless it to us, we ask. Amen.